Hi, I'm Nell Haynes, a cultural and linguistic anthropologist, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction to discourse analysis. So to begin with, what is discourse? First, it's a unit of language above the level of the sentence. So we're thinking about a sort of broader context here. Second, it's a particular way of seeing and representing the world. And third, it's focused on language in use in its social context. So discourse analysis is about concentrating not on language as an abstract system, but on actual instances of communicative action in the medium of language. But what does communicative action in the medium of language encompass? Essentially, this means we're looking for meaningful symbolic behavior that might come through in written language, oral language, signed language, even other things we do with our bodies that communicate, and also includes visual languages that we see in social media, like emojis, GIFs, other things that draw on sort of visual signifiers. So one of the most important scholars talking about discourses was Michel Foucault. He was concerned with first, the ways micro level interactional and textual practices constitute our social worlds. So how do these things that we are calling language here actually create our world and our understanding of it? Second, he was interested in the ways our everyday communicative and representational practices are structured by larger systems of belief and hierarchies of knowledge. And third, he wanted to understand how our uses of language feed ideological systems, just as we want to know how ideologies shape the way we use language. So seeing this as an interactive process, something that happens both ways. So when Foucault was talking about discourses, he insisted that texts are never neutral. Discourses are associated with ideological orientations. This means that conventional ways of communicating correspond to conventional ways of thinking. These are things he calls ideologies. So to define ideologies, we can think of them as conventional sets of interrelated ideas that correspond to a particular worldview. Some examples we see often are capitalism, religion, democracy, even the idea of gender as a binary. These are larger systems of thought that affect the ways we see things on a smaller level. And so ideologies often structure even what can be discussed or asked. So moving from discourses to discourse analysis, really the analysis of discourse asks what happens when people draw on the knowledge they have about language to do things in the world. When we say knowledge about language, that means people are drawing on memories of what they have said before or written before, memories of what they've heard other people say, what they've seen, what they've read. Um, so all of their memories of language and experiences create a, a sort of resource reservoir from which they can draw to do things in the world. And these include exchanging information, expressing feelings, making things happen, creating beauty, entertaining, all the things that we use language to do. So discourse analysis begins with description in order to achieve interpretation of the motivations and effects of linguistic practices. So in order to describe a text, we can ask a lot of questions about it. What is the text about? Who is the communicator? Who is the author? Or who is otherwise responsible for the text? Who is the intended audience? And who is the actual audience? How does this text fit into what people usually do with language in this context? What motivated the text? What's the medium of the text? What's the genre? What register or voice is used? And what is the social function of the text? And social function can have to do with identity, community, 
information exchange, humor, play, entertainment. It might be about conflict or face management. What is it that this text is trying to do in the world? So in order to answer these questions, we find specific instances in the text that we can point to. These might be words, they might be word fragments, it might be sentences, it might be concepts. Okay, so we're going to do an example now of remarks made by President Trump. Um, and this document also includes Vice President Pence and members of the Coronavirus Task Force, um, but we'll concentrate on actual uh, statements by President Trump. These are statements from April 10th, 2020, which is in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19, but also happens to be Good Friday, which becomes important in this text. So if you'd like to find this full statement, but the link is here on the screen, um, but it's also important to note that this was originally a televised press conference that was then typed up as a transcript and put on the whitehouse.gov website. Okay, so I've got here two different paragraphs. These are not consecutive paragraphs in the statement, um, but we have the first paragraph where the president is sort of introducing himself, greeting people, and then he, he introduces others who will be speaking. And then the second paragraph that I've included here is the paragraph where he kind of returns to um, substantive information about which he's speaking. Thank you very much, everybody, and good afternoon. Today is Good Friday, and this Sunday, millions of Christians celebrate Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At this holy time, we pray that God will heal the sick and comfort the heartbroken and bless our heroes. As American families look forward to Easter, we're reminded that our story ends not in despair, but in triumph and renewal. Very appropriate, isn't it? Our experts are monitoring the data from every part of our country having to do with the topic that we're here to discuss. In the midst of grief and pain, we're seeing clear signs that our aggressive strategy is saving countless lives. Uh, tremendous progress is being made, although when you look at some of the numbers, I just spoke with Governor Cuomo, we had a good talk. When you look at those numbers, uh, the numbers of death, people that have died, uh, it's so uh, horrible. Okay, so when we start, we're going to think about what stands out in the text. Um, generally, when I'm reading through the first time, I'll underline or circle things that seem important, that seem confusing, that seem out of place, or things that are repeated. Um, so some other things you can look for are paraphrasing. You know, where are things said in a certain way that they might be said in a different way? coding or euphemism? Where are terms used to sort of cover up maybe a, an uncomfortable topic? Repetitions and counting, as I said before, if you see a similar word or concept repeated a lot, that's noteworthy. Active versus passive voice. I'm sure you've all had professors who urge you not to use the passive voice because it might obscure some of the details or the, the intentionality behind a, a statement. Um, so thinking about where active and passive voice are used and what might that might obscure or highlight is important. Also hedging. Hedging is something people do that diminishes the importance or, um, or impact of the statement they're going to make. So if I say something like, well, you might have different information, but what I'm seeing is I'm hedging. I'm saying what I'm about to say, you might contradict. You might disagree with me, but I think this is important. That's an example of hedging. We can also look for nominalization and verbalization. 
these are phenomena where something that is not a noun is turned into a noun, usually with a suffix, or something that is not a verb is turned into a verb. Also, knowledge claims can be important. How is the person, the speaker or writer, demonstrating the knowledge that they have? Tense can be important, past, present, future, and all of the other tenses we have might indicate something about this information. Explicit or implicit classifications can be important. How is the speaker or writer categorizing things? Um, how are they defining what belongs in a particular category? Politeness is also an important factor. Um, the grammar, the terms of address that people use can indicate something there. Metaphors could be very important. Also thinking about what is erased, particularly if there are social groups that are, that are erased, if there are particular histories that are erased in the language. Also thinking about how authority is created. How does the author or speaker prove that they have the authority to speak on this subject? Similarly, how is authenticity created? How does the speaker or author prove that they are who they say they are? How are other voices incorporated? How are things like quotations or references to things other people have said within the text? Um, and what other texts are alluded to or used? Okay, so looking again at the president's statement, um, I've circled the words that stand out to me. So we have in his opening paragraph, the word everybody, you know, this is sort of his idea of, who's he, of who he's addressing. We see a lot of words associated with Christianity. We also have words that have a patriotic tone to them, heroes, American families. And we also have this sort of, um, and he explicitly uses the word story and these ideas of triumph and renewal. In the second paragraph, we see experts and data. We also see these sort of affective words, grief and pain, aggressive strategy, saving lives, progress. At the end, we see death, died, and horrible. And the first thing that stands out to me is that we're seeing very different things in these two paragraphs. Um, so I would consider them separately first and then think about what they can tell us in the context of one another. For time purposes, I'll mostly concentrate on this first paragraph, but I will do a, a, a bit with the second paragraph so you can see how they fit together. So taking the first paragraph, we can start with what is this text about? And it seems to be about addressing an audience and defining who that audience is. Trump starts with saying everybody, but he also references Christians and American families. Who is the communicator? Particularly in this transcript, we see very clearly in all caps, the president. Um, we know that that president is President Trump and that this is, you know, a leader, um, an executive officer in the government. But the communicator is not always who is responsible for the text. So in this case, we do think that the president is responsible for the text. If this were the press secretary, um, the communicator would be that secretary, but the responsible person for the text may still be the president. But here we have the president as both communicator and responsible for the text. Yet at the same time, we can also think about larger circles of responsibility. So this text might be re representing the full administration of this president or the president's party, the Republican Party. In thinking about the audience, who is the intended audience, based on these words, we have everybody at the beginning and then a focus on Christians and American families. But we can think about who the actual audience is. Originally, as a press conference, the press was the actual audience. Um, that was then taped or displayed live on television. So we have viewers of the press conference on television. 
And then also the transcript was placed on whitehouse.gov. So we have the readers of the website as the actual audience. We also need to think about how this text fits into what people usually do with language in this context. Um, does Trump usually begin his addresses this way? Do presidents of the United States usually begin addresses this way? And then we can think about what mo motivated the text. So we have, you know, the, the obvious answer of this is a statement on the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's a motivator. Um, but the particular timing of Easter has motivated the language that we're seeing here. What is the medium? Again, we have the live conference, we have the television cast of the conference, the press conference, and then also this website that houses the transcript. Um, what is the genre of this text? Well, it's an official address. It's an opening of an official address. We also see a Christian framework and a message of hope. We see a lot of um, you know, ideas of triumph and renewal referencing hope. You can also think about what the register or voice used is. So we have this religious and hopeful register coming across through the text. Um, and then what is the social function of the text? Well, we have a particular identity being instantiated here through Trump's references to Christianity. It may reflect back on him, Christian identity. Um, and we can also see it in terms of face management. He is presenting himself in a certain way. Okay, to take the second paragraph, here we have references to experts and data, aggressive strategies, progress, but also we have death and died. So what is this text about? It's about experts and data. It's about strategy and it's about progress, although we might question the evaluation of what's happening as progress. Who is the communicator? Again, you know, we have the president, but in this particular framing, the president may be a leader, but is not necessarily among the experts. Who is responsible for the text? Again, the president, possibly the, the president's administration, the president's political party. Um, we also have a reference to Governor Cuomo, and we might think about how some of the text places responsibility upon him as well. In terms of an intended audience, you know, we might go back to the first paragraph and say, well, the intended audience is everybody. Again, more specifically, perhaps those affected in some way by COVID-19, which again, we know from our experiences is pretty much everybody. Okay, so who is the actual audience? Again, this is the same as last time, the press, viewers of the press conference, readers of the website, how does text fit into what people usually do with language in this context? Um, in order to do that, we might want to compare it with other speeches of Trump, other speeches of other presidents or other world leaders, and see if this is a very similar genre or if there are different things happening here. What motivated the text? Certainly we have the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, this talk he had with the Governor Cuomo might be important as a motivation. What is the medium? Again, same as last time, live conference, television, and transcript on the website. What is the genre? Again, we have an official address. Um, but in this paragraph, instead of the genre being a sort of welcome, where we have a genre of communicating information and this idea of progress versus stagnation. What is the register or voice used? We have a bit more of a, a reporting voice, although it's important to note that at times we see these informal asides, um, which is something characteristic of much of Trump's speeches. So, you know, this might help us decide whether this text looks like other texts in this context. And then finally, what's the social function of this text? Again, we see face management, we see a concentration on progress happening here and downplaying of death. And also informational, we have references to experts and data, 
um, there is some mention of death. So that would lead to a sort of mitigating this idea of concentrating on progress. Okay, so, you know, we've, we've thought about these particular questions about the text, um, but we can go a little more in depth than just looking at particular words. So there are some useful linguistic concepts to, to take note of. The first I've alluded to already, but things like style, register, genre, and framing can be important. Register usually indicates a level of formality. For example, the language you use in a classroom might be different than language you use with your friends. In the classroom, you might use less slang, you might use more formal terms of address, you might use words that are more technical. Genre, again, is kind of about the, the goals or the kind of text that we're looking at. Framing might involve things like metaphor, idioms, um, even certain narrative conventions. And this all comes together in style. And I think the easiest way to think about style here is the differences between hearing former President Obama speak and current President Trump speak. Um, Obama has a very formal register. He uses a lot of prosody. He has a kind of um, performance oriented way of projecting his voice. Whereas Trump has a more informal register. He has these asides that I was talking about before. He goes off script. Um, and those things kind of as a, taken as a whole can be thought about in terms of a difference in style. We can also think about highlighting erasure and silences. So what are the things that the author or speaker is drawing attention to and what are they trying to keep their audience from thinking about too much? Um, they might entirely leave out of their text um, certain references that one would expect to be there. So those would be erasures and silences. Another useful concept is that of indexicality. And indexicality is really thinking about how the referent of a word changes depending on context. So a simple example of this is the word you. Depending on who is in the room or who is listening, when I use the word you, that referent changes. Who I'm talking about using the word you changes depending on context. One way to remember the word indexicality and what it means is to think about your index finger, which we often use to point. So indexicality is about what a word points to. Now, the example of you is a fairly direct form of indexicality, but indexicality can also be used in indirect ways. Words that are associated with a particular socioeconomic class, with a certain immigrant population, with a certain region of the United States or world um, will index a certain kind of identity or subject position. So the word y'all used instead of all of you or you guys indexes maybe a regional identity um, and that becomes indirectly associated with things like class and education level as well at times. So indexicality is really thinking about the kind of indirect things we associate with a particular word, an accent, other linguistic features. Another example of this would be the, the sort of quote unquote valley girl affect to language. So this is not so much about words that they use, although some words are associated with it, but the, the rising intonation and other kinds of vocal aspects that we hear in valley girl like tubular well it's like a totally great day it's like totally awesome those index again a certain education level maybe a certain socioeconomic class certainly a region as well another concept to think about is active versus passive voice which i mentioned earlier thinking about how um, passive voice often obscures information another thing we can think about is what's called indirects. 
And these are statements that seem to be aimed at a general audience, but are actually implicitly geared towards particular people or groups. So if I were in a classroom on a day papers were due and said, it really bothers me when certain people turn in their papers late. Um, I have not named a particular individual or set of individuals, but people who turned their paper in late might know that I'm actually talking about them. Euphemism is another feature that, you know, allows us to sort of avoid a sensitive topic by using words that reference that topic without explicitly stating it. So the use of euphemism in texts can be important. Also hedging, downplaying the importance of your words. Foregrounding and backgrounding in structure can be important. What's mentioned first in the paragraph, what's repeated, what's sort of stuck in there, but with attention taken away from it. So similar to highlighting and erasure, um, but looking more at the structure of a larger piece of text versus um, what's mentioned and not mentioned. And then finally, intertextuality and interdiscursivity. The relationship of this text to other texts or this text to other discourses. So we can look at all of these things on different levels. We can look at morphology, the form of specific words. We can look at lexicon. We can think about this as like the vocabulary, the kinds of words that are used. We can look at the syntax, language in the level of a phrase or sentence or other language unit. And then discourse, how everything fits together, how it sits in a particular context, and what its relationship is to worldview and ideology. So if we're looking again at this first paragraph of the statement by Trump, this isn't a fantastic example for morphology, but there are a few things we see here. We see two instances of contractions, we're and isn't it, at the end of the paragraph. One way to think about morphology is to think, you know, why were these particular words used instead of other words being used? Why do we have contractions rather than the more formal? We are reminded, or it is very appropriate, is it not? So we can think about the, the particular form of words used here. And this brings us to issues of style and framing. Um, we see a very particular style coming through that's slightly less formal here. Okay, so to move on to lexicon, the vocabulary and word choice, we see quite a few instances that might be noteworthy. We have Good Friday, Christians, Easter, Resurrection, Jesus Christ, Holy, Pray, God. We have words like heal, sick, comfort, heartbroken, that are kind of affective words. We have bless again. And then we have words like hero, American, families, our. And finally, in this narrative of, of hope, we have words like despair, triumph, and renewal. Um, and so we see particular things happening with highlighting, erasure, and silences, and indexicality here. So, and we'll return to that in a minute. In terms of the syntactic level, or you know, looking at sentences and phrases and the paragraph structure, we see a kind of movement through different types of language here. We have the first sentence, which is a very general address. We then have quite a bit of language invoking Christianity. We have a short bit of kind of patriotic or what we might even call nationalistic language underlined here in green. We go back to Easter briefly, and then we have epic narrative kind of language, triumph and renewal. Um, we might even talk about the very last sentence as a fifth type, very appropriate, isn't it? Which kind of brings the formality down a level. Um, so here we see instances of active versus passive voice, foregrounding and backgrounding and structure. Um, we have the sort of Christianity aspect foregrounded and some other aspects backgrounded. 
and then also thinking about context and worldview. So I've kept the same uh, sections underlined here, but we can think about intertextual relationships. Um, so certainly texts like the Bible or other Christian texts, um, other forms of nationalistic and patriotic texts, texts that are also stories that don't end, end in despair, but in triumph and renewal, this sort of message of hope and also other texts, perhaps even of Trump's, that have this kind of informal language put in at, at strategic points. And then also this allows us to think about ideology and worldview as well. Okay, so in terms of morphology and lexicon, we see a particular register. We see a slightly informal language, and that communicates an identity, an identity that Trump has tried to sort of perform throughout his political career um, that appeals to the common person that is not your average politician. Um, and we can think about many nuances of this over time, but in general, he's putting forward a certain identity through this informal language. Second, we see a really complex definition of who's being addressed. He begins with everybody, but then specifically speaks to Christians, Americans, and families. So we see a sort of equation of everybody with Christians, Americans, and families. And within this, we see erasure specifically of Jewish people, um, because this is all happening during the time of Passover as well but also other religions and non-religious people. We also see an erasure of people without families or whose families do not necessarily fall into definitions of families that we often see in political speech. So we have kind of an intertextuality here with how families are spoken about in political speech more generally. Um, and we also see an indexing heroes is usually used in reference to militarism. So we see kind of patriotic and nationalistic language coming in as well through indexicality. Okay, in terms of syntax, we have active voice framing speaker and audience as actively praying, but ultimately um, it is God who has the ability to act through or in answer to prayers. Um, we also see in the structure, the president begins with a general salutation, religious references, nationalistic references, and a hopeful message. In terms of discourse, we see intertextual relationships with the Bible, nationalistic texts, stories with happy endings, and you know, corresponding ideologies of Christianity, nationalism, and when we see nationalism and happy endings in confluence, this might bring up ideas of American exceptionalism as well. Okay, so then we have questions to ask of the text again. What is the text supposedly versus actually about? Well, supposedly it's an introduction to information about COVID-19. Um, but what we actually see happening is defining who the American public is. How does this text fit into what people usually do with language in this context? Well, this is a question we haven't really answered here in this video, but it depends how we define people. Is people Trump himself? Is it Republicans? Does it refer to US politicians or politicians around the world? And looking at different levels of, of comparison here might be informative and tell us how this text is functioning in relation to others. We can also think about what motivated the particular form of this text. Supposedly, it was motivated by a need for response and updates on the COVID-19 pandemic. But what we actually see is that it's intended to reinforce Trump's popularity among his political base. And what is the social function of the text? Again, we see face management and political consolidation among, you know, reinforcing certain narratives and popularity among this political base. Now, these aren't necessarily all um, applicable to the two paragraphs we've looked at here, but further themes to think about in doing discourse analysis, 
our first language ideology. What is the value of different kinds of language, accent, code switching? You know, this might be something in terms of formal versus informal. It might have to do with accents. It might have to do with, you know, we see politicians uh, interject certain phrases in Spanish all of the time. And these are valued in different ways. Second, issues of power. These might come through in politeness, grammar, who is named and who is not named. Um, we saw in this, in the second paragraph, Trump references experts, but doesn't give specific names. Um, and also performativity. What is the ability of the speaker to actually make something happen? We also have issues of community and identity. How is this person defining community or defining their own identity? Are they reinforcing assumptions or kind of moving beyond them in terms of community and identity? Also issues of temporality. This could be in terms of past versus present versus future tense that they're speaking in, but also the uh, the longevity of the text, if it's written, if it's spoken, if it's recorded or not. Verbal art and performance can be really important. What are the sort of affective qualities of the text? Is this something that's beautiful to listen to? Is it something that's difficult to listen to? What sorts of emotions might be evoked through this? And finally, social and cultural capital. What is the social and cultural capital of the person who is speaking? Is this text reinforcing that? Is it um, having some effect on listeners' social and cultural capital? Okay, so the questions we've talked about here have been primarily qualitative, but there are quantitative questions that can be useful and quantitative approaches to discourse analysis. Um, and so often these rely on something called corpus linguistics, which essentially means you take a huge amount of text, digitize, and use computer programs to analyze it in particular ways. So some things that are um, important to analyze is the frequency of a particular word or what words are most frequent, where those words are likely to occur. Do they occur at the beginning of a text, at the end, somewhere in the middle? Are they always at the beginning of a sentence? And also adjacency. What words appear near the word of interest? So one good example of this is a study done by a linguist named Paul Baker, who looked at a huge number of magazine articles about unmarried people. And what he found was that the most common word for an unmarried man in these articles was bachelor. And the most common word for unmarried women was spinster. In terms of adjacency pairs, eligible bachelor was the most common phrase and frustrated spinster was the most common phrase. So, you know, we see here huge gender differences in understandings and perceptions of unmarried people so that's one example of how we actually get an interesting qualitative interpretation out of this quantitative data that he used. So I'm not going to go into these more quantitative approaches in this video, but I can do a separate one specifically on Twitter. So how to scrape data from Twitter, you know, get a bunch of tweets and then use a program called AntConf to analyze that in terms of you know, what I've just talked about here, frequency of words, where they appear, adjacency, um, and some other quantitative aspect of discourse. But returning to our more qualitative approach for now, all of these questions we answered help us answer larger questions. And some of those larger questions in linguistic anthropology are how do people consolidate power or resist power through language? How do people reinforce or contest inequalities through discourse? How do people create social categories or belonging and difference in communication? And how do people linguistically negotiate identity? Um, and these questions that have to do with power and inequality are considered part of critical discourse analysis. And the word critical there simply means that it is discourse analysis in service of deconstructing 
power relations. Okay, so thinking specifically about media and discourse analysis, it's important to remember that media, and in particular social media themselves, are inherently ideological. Um, and this happens on two levels. First, the political economies of access and control are ideological. Some people have access, others have less or no access. Um, but also in terms of their potential as mechanisms for reinforcing normative ideas or promoting counter normative representations. So keeping in mind that media, both social media and mass media, are used to control people, um, but they're also used to resist control. And so seeing this duality informs our understanding and the way we approach discourse analysis. Okay, so there are a few media specific questions we can also ask of a text. Um, we can ask what is the structure of the text? What's the typography? What's the font? What's the size of the font? Um, what sorts of spelling is being used? What are the word choices? What is sentence structure? And particularly in thinking about social media, things like spelling, word morphology, to go back to our previous term, um, varies quite widely. We see the letter U substituting Y-O-U. We see THX um, substituting thanks. We see emojis or just a colon closed parenthesis as a smiley face. Um, and these can be really important to understanding the function of that text. Second, we can ask how has technology mediated this text? And this might be temporal, this might be in terms of access, it might be in terms of whether it's entertaining versus informational. We also think about who has access to this text um, and why is it shared through the medium it's shared through and not another. Um, and we often see texts shared through multiple mediums. Um, so thinking about the, the popularity, the issues of access, the accessibility in terms of things like, is it easy to read on the screen? Is it easy to find? Um, thinking about the way those things affect this text can be really important. Okay, so to go back again to this first paragraph of the COVID response, we can think about these media questions. So what is the structure of this text? Well, we see here, and I've, this is coming from a screenshot of the whitehouse.gov transcript. It's a white background with black font. It's, I believe, a sans serif font, even though I wrote that it is serif. It's fairly clear to read. Um, I took this screenshot on my laptop so the size, you know, is sort of the um, default size that it came up as. So, you know, we're seeing a fairly stark representation of this text. We also have to think about how technology has mediated this text. So this was originally a temporally curtailed event. It was an oral speech that was then recorded via video um, and then further transcribed and posted on whitehouse.gov, so we see this as um, making it more accessible and acting as a repository. We can think about who has access to this text. So originally, um, when this was the live press conference, it was people who were able to watch television at that time, um, who had a television and signal, or had some sort of recording mechanism to watch it later. Um, now on the website, anyone with internet connection, hardware to access it, and knowledge of its existence could access it. Um, and then thinking about why it's shared through this medium and not another, originally it was on television, which is a kind of passive medium, but has issues of accessibility, even though it's quite popular, accessibility in terms of timing, although those are less issues now than they were a few decades ago. Um, but also it's reposting on the internet, on whitehouse.gov in text form, whitehouse.gov as an official site. So this is now an official document. 
Um, but we also might look to see if there's um, a recording of the video of the press conference on YouTube, or if there are gifts that have been made of particular statements Trump made during that press conference, um, and all the other ways this text could be remixed and end up on different platforms. Okay, so to end, I just want to point out two pitfalls that we can fall into in discourse analysis. Um, and these have to do with scope, both of them. The first is superficiality, essentially lacking interpretation. So looking again at this first paragraph of Trump's address, saying, okay, well, he makes lots of references to Christianity, he must be Christian. We know from many contexts and other discussions of Trump that, you know, he is not necessarily a regular churchgoer, um, that he's not closely associated with many ideals of Christianity. So that interpretation would actually not incorporate a lot of the other knowledge of context that we have about this text. Um, another pitfall is overgeneralization, trying to theorize beyond the scope of the data. So again, looking at this paragraph, we might say, oh, well, there are a bunch of references to Christianity here. That means that separation of church and state no longer exists. Um, so using this one paragraph to sort of make a very broad statement um, would not be useful in terms of discourse analysis. So this brings us back to remembering discourse analysis is really trying to use description to achieve a meaningful interpretation of the motivations and effects of linguistic practices. So what are the motiv motivations behind the particular way this text exists in the world? And also, what are the effects? Is it reinforcing power relations? Is it working against inequalities? What are the potential or probable material effects of this text? 